for three basic reasons. Uh, one is it's extremely important to, to, to get this time. <laughs> Run for president. <laughs> Okay, um, I didn't know if I was going to come to speak to five people or 500 or wherever in between. I've structured this pretty informally. I have a lot of materials that I'll basically put up on the screen and narrate. Um, <clears throat> I don't think you want to hear, a, hear me read a paper or something like that. Anyway, uh, I'd like to know from the audience what kind of makeup uh, there is present here. So, how many of you would identify as uh, being already somewhat aware about the, the issues that we're trying to raise about 9-11, uh, the buildings being brought down by demolitions as opposed to the official story? How many of you basically tend to believe the official story? Okay, so I'm not like, I just want to know who I'm speaking to. So I'll, I'll try and give you some of the background for uh, <clears throat> why you're not crazy <laughs> in that sense then. Because uh, there's a lot of people who, if you look at the buildings coming down, they know intuitively, immediately, something's not right. And it shouldn't have happened that way. You can look at building seven come down and you can be immediately convinced it's a demolition. It looks like a demolition. What I've done is basically reinforce those observations by showing you that not only does it look like a demolition, but it's coming down at absolute free fall through its own structure, which is impossible for it to 
for that to happen uh, while it's in the process of demolishing itself. So there's a lot of things like that. But um, I'm going to start with a little background information here. This is a video that just sort of outlines the construction of the Twin Towers. Uh, so both Towers 1 and 2, what you have is a central core structure, and then you have a perimeter structure with a lot of space in between. So this is sort of a, a special construction so that it leaves a lot of floor space available for unimpeded office space. There's over an acre on each floor. Okay, it's a huge cross-section building. I think it's like 64 meters square. Okay, and then here are the, the actual floor slabs that are supported by trusses. And then there's at the top, that little structure looks like a spider or something on the top. That's called a hat truss. One of the things it does, there are 47 core columns that are very massive box columns that go up through the center. Uh, they actually change structure at a certain point, but uh, it's a very substantial, essentially it's a building within a building. And so that central core structure is tied off at the top by this hat truss, which also, it connects the, those core columns together and it connects them to the perimeter. Okay. Now the north tower, on top of the tower you also have uh, a television transmitter, an antenna. And that's very dominant. So you can identify the North Tower when you're seeing it as the one that has that mast on top. And uh, we'll get back to that later. So uh, when you see the top of the, t the North Tower coming down, which you will in a few minutes, keep in mind the structure that's supporting that mast. It's sitting right over those 47 core columns tied together by this hat truss, and then the antenna is right on top of that. And so when you see the, if you're aware of this structure, it helps to understand that a little bit. Let me pull this over. Um, NOVA, you know, they did this, uh, a program about why the towers fell, and there's all this disinformation in it. They really minimized the existence, in fact, oh look at that. See that's the central core structure as it's being built versus what Nova showed is just like spaghetti, these little thin columns going up there with no sense of them being uh, tied together in any way. And they're basically saying, oh, if you take out these trusses, this whole thing is just going to fall like a pile of spaghetti, which is baloney. You could have all the floors pancake down, and what you would then have is that central core structure remaining, standing. So the original pancake theory for the buildings coming down simply doesn't work. What you need is a mechanism that would demolish the core structure. And so the official story uh, has gone through a number of changes over time. Um, as something gets pointed out, hey, that doesn't work, they change the story and that's the new official story. So the, the pancake theory, if you remember that, if you watch NOVA, you have pancake theory on the brain. Uh, that's not even the official story anymore. Nobody believes that anymore. But that's what the public was told originally. Um, okay, these are the this is the way the perimeter is built. Uh, each of these, uh, these are like three of the perimeter columns. And if you notice, uh, there's the various sections. One of these sections like this is three stories tall. If you had a person standing, uh, it would be, you know, half the height of one of those little sections in there. These are huge, like 30, I think 30 feet long or something like that. I don't have the numbers tip my tongue, but it's uh, three stories tall, okay? And these are the things that you see flying around, ejected horizontally at some of them over 60 miles an hour. Uh, and that's, that was what really caught my attention when I first started looking at this, is you saw 
such a horizontal ejection of material that um, there's a lot of things that don't look right. What, what, what sort of thing? Where would you estimate? Uh, depending on the height in the building, because they're stronger at the bottom and then they sort of like a pyramid. In other words, they're built to take what's above them, right? So, but typically, I think about four tons for one of those, something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. This is the trusses that span between the outer walls and the core, and they're uh, they're very large uh, cross section. They're, and also notice that there are bridge trusses that go sideways. In other words, it's a two-dimensional grid of trusses. When they showed this on Nova, they didn't even mention the grid trusses. They acted as though each one of these could fall and they could fail independently. But you're not going to have these trusses falling independently because they're not built the way they were shown on the program. So they're tied together very substantially. Uh, there's not that much concrete in the building, but these floor slabs are poured on a, on a metal decking here like this and they have like four inch floor slabs poured on top of that. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna show you a little bit, if I can, sometimes I have trouble getting this to run, I might have to try it a couple ways. Um, I used a program when I was doing my analysis, uh, originally I used a program called um, uh, Physics Toolkit. It's pretty primitive, it was a, it was not designed to be used as I was using it. This is a more uh, advanced program that uh, does what I was doing only better, and uh, it's called Tracker. And what, one of the things I've done, by the way, is you can import, you can import a video in this and, and analyze it. I've put up a physics lab on my website. So if any of you are teachers or students or would like to actually duplicate the kind of measurements I did, all the pieces are there. You can actually import the videos, use the tools to measure and so forth. I even have the material for, that you can use to calibrate the videos so that you can get good measurements. So, um, but here's the way this works. If you import a video into this tool, uh, this is just me dropping a soccer ball at a school where I once taught. Over here it shows, okay, here, before I do that, uh, if I turn on, okay, see that little mark there? As you step through it, see I put a little mark on each frame as the ball drops, and that mark, then the position on the screen and then the timing based on it's every 30th of a second, you know, you have a frame. Uh, from the timing and the position, you can actually do a graph of various things. So right now it says over here Y. That's the vertical height as a function of time. So it just looks like a per, uh, parabola there. If I change this to be a velocity, a downward velocity, Notice it comes out a straight line, or essentially a straight line. And that's because when you drop something in free fall, the speed starts off at zero. As soon as you let go of the object, it's moving at zero speed. But then it picks up speed, and it picks up more speed, and picks up more speed as it falls. And it'll pick up the same additional amount of speed every second. And so the amount of speed you gain each second is what you call acceleration. And so there's a characteristic acceleration for gravity. So anything you drop, big rock, small rock, they'll drop at the same rate. But anything you drop, it'll gain downward speed at the rate of 9.8 meters per second every second. Or 32, roughly 32 feet per second each second. So we, round, we call that 32 feet per second squared. And it's how many feet per second of speed do you gain every second? That's what that's talking about, okay? And so it comes out like a linear graph. Now if I go over here to analyze, it'll just show the graph. And now I'm gonna say a curve fit. I can choose a range of data here. And look over here, here it gives the equation of the line if you're into that. 
But over here, there's this number right in here. And, well, whatever it is, that, that number where the arrow's pointed says 9.75. Uh, so the, if what it's doing is it's using these data points I've selected and fitting the best straight line that fits through that data. And it's coming out very close to 9.8, as I told you, meters per second squared, right? That's the acceleration of gravity. And so depending on exactly which points you choose, here's 9.78. So that's the, the character of measurement data is there's always a little bit of random error, you know, measurement error. And so it's not a perfect exact fit. You just put the best line you can through the data. And um, that's, the, that's the nature of doing science, all right? And so to the ability of this to do the measurement, you're pretty much right at the free fall limit because that's what you're looking at. You're looking at something there's almost nothing acting on the ball except for gravity. There is air resistance. And at the very end, you can see it trailing off a little bit. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, like right down here. See at the very tail end, it sort of is above the line out there a little bit. Because even after falling that short a distance, there's a little bit of air resistance that's showing up in the picture. OK, so anyway, you can measure stuff like that, and so we have a tool. Here, I'm not going to close that. I'm going to leave this in the background. Okay. Um, let's look at the North Tower. Okay, the North Tower is uh, one of the twin towers. It has that mast on top, as I told you. And what I've done here is I've imported that into Tracker. And I have a, a point here that I've put on this little piece of the edge of the roof line that you can see there. And I'm going to follow that frame by frame as it goes. And so you only have it for a short distance before it uh, descends into that cloud of debris, but for that few seconds, you can actually track and see how it moves, okay? Now, by the way, n before we just start talking about numbers and measurements here, notice the very first thing you see moving. Like as soon as this building starts to collapse, watch that mast and roof line right there. Okay, now let's come back. Down here at the bottom where you see those flames and things, that's like the break point, the, the way that Byzant, I mean he's a structural engineer who did the sort of a classic analysis of this two days after the event and got it published. And that became the basis of the NIST investigation here. And Byzant's theory is this top section acted like a pile driver crushing down the building underneath it. That's his sort of a model. Because he recognized, he didn't go for this pancaking floors, he realized that crushing those core columns was really the, the nub of the problem. How do you get those columns to fail? And, but look at that line, look at that line right there as the motion begins. You see it's not going anywhere until the top section of the building is already about half its size before that bottom section starts to move down the building at all. So the very first thing that gets demolished is the top section of the building above where the airplanes hit and the very first thing you see moving is the roof line and that mast, which is on the top of those 47 core columns. And if any of those core columns were left uh, remaining, it would interfere with this thing collapsing the way it does. It's coming straight down through its structure 
it is not at free fall. If I take this measurement and I look at the velocity versus time, we've done this before with the soccer ball, right? But this time, you can see that it's sort of a straight line. And here, let's go to analyze, curve fit, straight line, okay. This says 6.87. It's not 9.8. Turns out it's about two-thirds of the acceleration of gravity. So it's not in absolute free fall. It's coming down about two-thirds of free fall. But notice that that's a straight line. We're very close to being a straight line. And what that means is it's accelerating downward without, uh, with, with the, most of the resistance removed. In fact, look at this. If I take a hammer and hit a nail, and if I take the hammer and drive a nail into a piece of wood, when the, when the hammer head hits the nail, what's going to happen? It's going to exert a force on that nail, right? And that force is greater than the weight of the hammer head. If I took the hammer and set it on the nail, it won't go driving the nail into the wood unless it's uh, sitting in a piece of styrofoam or something, right? A heavy hammer and nail and a piece of styrofoam, I just push it on through. But if I have a piece of wood that's capable of supporting the hammer's weight, okay, so the nail is started on the wood, I set the hammer on it, nothing happens. If I come down with some speed, what happens is there is this excess force that's generated. Now, from a physics point of view, what you can say is that excess force comes from the momentum of the hammer head. And as the hammer loses its momentum, it gives, it sort of transfers its momentum into the force, into the form of this excess force. So the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Taken, how many of you here have had some physics? Good, some, okay. So rate of change of momentum is how you get that extra force, right? But what does it take to give that extra force? The hammerhead has to lose some of its momentum, doesn't it? And how do you lose momentum? Well, momentum is mass times velocity. And so if you lose momentum, it's going to have to be by slowing down. But look what's happening. Does this building ever slow down? It's accelerating downward the entire time. It's not slowing down. And therefore, there is no impulse. The impulse is where you have this transfer of this, ex of this momentum into this excess force. There's no place along the way where you're actually cashing in some of your momentum into the form of this excess force. So you are not seeing the top section of this building crushing anything. How does it fall? Well, something had to get rid of all of that structure that was supporting it, but it couldn't have come from the falling mass. So it's not a matter that the mass is crushing what's below it, it's that the mass up in the top is falling into a pre-pulverized bunch of material that was already destroyed by something else. So here again, we're looking at a literal graphical measurement-based proof that these buildings had to have been demolished to enable them to come down. Okay, so the whole idea that you could have the top section crush down what's underneath it, you don't see it playing out when you actually look at what's happening in detail. It is not crushing. It's falling into a void. No, it's not free fall. And the reason where, why the North Tower analysis here, I did a paper on this, if you go to my website, uh, it's called North Tower and Fundamental Physics, something like that, all right? I have a links page on my website. And it basically makes the point that I'm trying to make right now, is that uh, in order to 
uh, crush something, you need to decelerate the falling mass. Like when you take your hammer and you hit the nail, what happens to the hammer when it hits the nail? It stops, doesn't it? Which is why you have to pick it up and hit it again, right? You go wham, wham, wham. Why? Because each time you hit it, you have given up the momentum of the hammer, converted it into that excess force, which pushed the nail part way through, and you pick it up and you do it all over again. Here we see the top section of the building accelerating downward through the bottom section without giving up its momentum. It's gaining momentum the entire time. So this is, we're looking at proof. This is proof here. Question. Yeah? So it's not the only proof. I'm going to go through several, but go ahead. So the columns were destroyed or removed. Um, were, were they removed starting from the top going down or from that baseline where the fires were shown go, um, going up? How, how were those columns removed? Um, the point at which the actual break occurs appears to be a couple of floors above where the plane hit. So it's not actually even where the plane hit, but uh, it's a few floors above. I don't have the floor numbers on the tip of my tongue, but it's, uh, there's a point in there where it appears that the columns had to have been uh, pretty much synchronously demolished. Well, if you cut it in any way, the weight would start the downward process. And so I don't, I mean, I just know that the initiation of the demolition occurred starting at a floor right about that level, just above the plane level. Uh, whether there was a sequence that went on up, I'm not sure. In the South Tower, it's interesting, the plane hit a lot lower. So there's a lot larger top section and as that top section starts to come down in the south tower, and it actually starts to fall off the building, and it tips. But you can actually see flashes up in the top section of the building. So there is demolition going on all the way to the top. And uh, there's good reason to believe the entire top section of the building was demolished before it ever hit the ground. Okay, same thing here. The top section of the building was demolished as it was falling into this cloud, there's no sign of that top section continuing to exist anywhere else in the fall. So, yes, I think explosions were going on high in the building. And did the TV tower also disintegrate completely? No, the TV tower uh, is in the rubble pile. I did see a picture of that, uh, but uh, the, the framing of the building. The building itself, you know, if you have a normal if you have a normal collapse of a building, like from an earthquake or something like that, you tend to have big chunks of structural components surviving into the rubble pile. This is disintegrated into individual beams. It is, it is disassociated materials that are in the rubble pile. And virtually all the concrete has been turned to dust before it ever hit the ground. And that's one of the things, there's almost no concrete in the rubble pile, it's all over New York City. Okay, so whatever was happening, was happening during this process. I'm going to continue here a little bit. Uh, this is just showing you the layout. I'm going to be talking about building seven, that's over here. You can see this brownish looking building across the street from the North Tower. The North Tower didn't show the mast on top, but that's it here in the foreground. The South Tower is over there, and Building 7 is across the street. It's about half, not quite half the height of the Twin Towers. It's a huge building. By the way, if you were to, I don't know if I have the picture here or somewhere else. Um, here, let me back up. Okay. Here's a picture of a football field. And the red is uh, the footprint of the Building 7. 
Building 7 would occupy virtually the entire area. Those are the end zones out there. It's 100 meters uh, along the long edge, and it's almost the same width as a football field. So it is a mammoth building. It only looks dwarfed by the Twin Towers being beside them, beside it, okay? And so this building supposedly came down from fires on a few floors, burning only a few hours. I mean, that's, that's the theory, but I'll come back here in a minute. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you this. Um, here's a montage of the North Tower. So, one of the earliest things that caught my eye is just how broad this whole expanse of debris was. It, it didn't seem it was like it was just tumbling down. It was being blown outward. Uh, this is the same shot that I did the measurements on. Okay, watch on this one. I'm going to pause it if I can. Here, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure where the little pause button is. Um, well, there's a lot of, there's so many things to see here. I may play it again. Uh, this is the North Tower scene from the west side. Um, Brooklyn Bridge is in the background. Okay. Notice all these things under here. They're being blown out the side. I mean, you can see explosions. Now, people will quibble with you and say, well, those aren't explosions, that's just air pressure, all this stuff. Uh, I beg to differ, um, with good reason, actually. Here, there we go. Here. I'm gonna play this through one more time. Okay. Um, That's a, see a whole section of wall back there? A bunch of panels together. There was some of this to hit the Building 7. Now, on this or the next video, maybe it's the next one, as it pans down the building as it falls, here, this one. Watch, here, I'm going to try and point. See right here where I'm pointing? Look at all that stuff blowing out. It's just a continuous wave of stuff blowing out the side many floors below where this break point is occurring. And it, it's, it tracks down, that's the fastest moving downward event in this entire thing, is that, is that wave of demolition blowing out the side. I did one where I was tracking uh, how fast it came down even after the cloud came. I put little markers on there and tracked. Um, I put two markers, one indicating free fall. This was not free fall. The second marker was two thirds of free fall, which is what we saw in that top few seconds, right? And if you propagate that little mark at two thirds of free fall, guess what? That demolition wave keeps up all the way down. So that demolition wave of blowing stuff out the side is just a, a curtain of material coming out horizontally that moves down the building faster than the stuff falling just a few feet away from it. So this is a process within the building moving downward. I shouldn't say faster. It's probably a, about as fast as the material on the outside falling down. So, okay. Here is, okay, this is that same little section again. So right under here, you see all this stuff blowing out? And this is a closer up view of the same thing, and then it'll come to a corner view. So here, I'm gonna pause this. Now, if you have this wave of material blowing out the side, and then up here, higher than the, where that wave is happening, you have individual puffs coming out. 
How can that be due to air pressure? You've already blown out the walls. That happened first. That's already come by. And now you have these little pinpoint uh, blowouts. It's, it's crazy. It cannot be air pressure because you have a vessel where it's already been torn apart. There are no walls to hold the pressure. You have to blow out these very heavy windows. In fact, some of these are blowing out where there aren't any windows. And you have it throwing all kinds of material out. But that's happening where it's already had the walls opened up by this earlier wave of demolition. So these are like grasping at straws, trying to come up with rationales. What we are seeing is explosions. You're seeing it and there's very good reason to believe that that's actually what we're looking at. I want to keep going a second here. Okay, here's one more of the same. See, up here, there's all these pinpoint explosions going on, but the lower stuff is what came by earlier. That's the point I was trying to make there. Now, watch under here. See these little things here? See that puff right there, and over here, and over here? I mean, there's all of these. Let me back it up a little bit. Okay, watch, watch along that corner, all through here. I mean, you're seeing it. It's supposedly, I'm sure that it was designed to be under the canopy of all of this falling debris so you wouldn't see it. And it's not timed perfectly. And here we are looking up under this canopy, and there it is. You're watching the stuff blown out. Okay. This is one. A friend of mine, uh, okay. A lot of the stuff I've done on this has been in connection with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Well, I didn't work that closely with the organization as a whole, but there are particular individuals within that group that we really collaborated closely. One guy is a physics student down in uh, Tucson, uh, Justin Keough. And there's another guy who's, uh, I describe him as sort of a kid. He's not a kid. He's in his 40s, but I mean, he's... Uh, he is, he's a film geek. I mean, he's into collecting every last scrap of video that exists about 9-11, and he can put his fingers on it immediately, and he knows what he has. And I can call him up and I can say, I saw this little video clip on YouTube, and it had this spire right in line here, and I saw something funny going on, and and he said, oh yeah, that's from such and such a DVD, and he has a clip of that in my inbox within the hour. I mean, that's how good he is to work with. And uh, one of the things he does is he takes a lot of these videos, and you'll see some of them where the frame is doing this, but the buildings look stationary. That's because he's gone through it frame by frame and rectified the motion. So you can see a stabilized version of these motions. And that was done, uh, Nate did that manually. And it's an amazing job. And I just want to make sure I give him credit for that. But um, he's the one who put this uh, little composite here together. Let me go on here. Um, Let's look at the South Tower for a minute. Here's a South Tower montage. Now the difference is, notice where it's hit. See up there is where the North Tower was hit, South Tower was hit here. Notice how the top section falls off. Um, it's falling towards the east. Now here it is from the hotel across the, the street, and it's falling right towards us. And I'm going to back that up. And this is so, here, I got to catch earlier. All right. Look at that section as it's starting to tumble, and look at that roof line, okay? Now follow that roof line. Is 
It's like it goes in whole and it comes out like a skeleton. Okay? There's demolition going on in that top section of the building so that it turned that solid section into this uh, bunch of loose material already in that short a time as it just uh, creates this wave of the clouds. And I've done a number of videos. If you look at my website, I've tracked a few of these things. See this piece right over here where the arrow is? That fragments in the air. Here, here it is going along, and boom, it blows into two, and then each of those pieces blows into two. So you're actually watching explosions in the air, so there is explosive material in the debris that continues to be at work as uh, this goes along. In fact, right there, you see that? Here, just watch that little piece. This is not the one I did the analysis on, but that's the piece. You see how it blew apart there? It's hard to get here. I did a you know, slow motion, and so go to the website and you'll see that. Now here it is, the building is falling to the left. Now, this one has, oh, there's so much stuff to look at in here. Okay, one of the things that NIST, by the way, N-I-S-T, National Institute for Standards and Technology, that is the agency, it's an agency under the Commerce Department, and that's the agency the Bush administration assigned the task of explaining the building collapses, okay? It is a, not a regulatory agency. They don't do forensics. It was a building safety investigation, and the, in their charter they explicitly said that they had no authority to hold anybody accountable for anything. I mean, this was a non-investigation investigation, and they narrowed the definition of their mandate to account for why the buildings fell. They came right up to the point where they said, and because of such and such, collapse, total collapse was inevitable. They handled the rest of the entire event in one sentence like that. They did not explain what you're seeing when you see the buildings collapse. They went up to a point where they made the flat out, unsupported assertion that a certain thing was what caused it to happen, and then they said nothing about anything beyond that. So it was a, uh, anyway, one of the things that NIST claims caused, that triggered the collapse for the Twin Towers was that uh, these perimeter walls, which are 14-inch box columns of very high-grade steel. The perimeter columns were made of stronger raw material than the core columns even. Very stiff. But you see these perimeter columns bending in, and they claim that what happened was that those trusses, those floor trusses, were being heated and the, the heating caused them to sag, and as they sagged, they pulled those wall elements in and caused them to fail. And then somehow, magically, the, the core columns, they don't even talk about it, but somehow the instability propagated around by hand waving, and then everything fell, okay? But watch these things. These perimeter columns come in very quickly and only at the last minute. And by the way, they've done some calculations. If you try to heat up these floor columns, these floor trusses, until they would pull in, they actually would sag and they wouldn't pull anything in. You can't get it to, to work. It's a mechanism that does not work. But watch it happening here. right here. Well, it doesn't show it very well. There's another one later on that does. Okay. By the way, see all this stuff coming down, racing down the sides of the buildings? The break is way up above here. What's, what's happening way down here? It's like all of these ejections racing down the lower section of the building. 
that lower section of the building was not, uh, was not on fire. It was not compromised in any way. It was a strong, uh, healthy structure. And yet here's all this stuff racing down these walls. Did you have a question? Uh, well, I know Tony Zambodi was involved and there's some other engineers, I'm not sure. Ron Brookman might have been involved in that one. There's some of the guys involved with uh, architects and engineers uh, for 9-11 Truth. Huh? Did you all Oh, well, okay, that's a separate issue. Yeah, underwriters, laboratories, uh, one of the theories that was floated around for a while was the reason the buildings came down was the materials were somehow inferior, were not up to snuff. Uh, turned out that underwriters laboratories had tested both the raw materials and the assemblies, the floor assemblies, and everything was up to code, uh, up to specifications or whatever. And Kevin Ryan worked for underwriters laboratories, and when the president of underwriters laboratory was going along with this story, uh, he blew the whistle and got fired, but uh, he's one of, our, uh, one of our very creative elements within our movement. And he, uh, you don't want to mess with Kevin Ryan. He'll get on your case. Okay, so here it is. These are just racing down the building. This is the South Tower. Notice whenever you see one tower coming down and there's another one still standing, the South Tower fell first. Oh, look at all this stuff pouring out the corner. What is that? Molten aluminum. Oh, no way. Okay, it looks like molten steel, doesn't it? And the reason you can tell that it's the temperature of molten steel is because of the color. The color indicates the temperature. And in fact, it doesn't matter what the material is, any material that's heated to that temperature will be approximately that color. All right, due to the radiation. Uh, if you have molten aluminum, it melts at a much lower temperature, and so it won't look yellow like that. It also is a very reflective material, and so once, when, molten, when mel aluminum melts, it will look silvery, like a pool of mercury. All right? So this is not, I mean, NIST, see? NIST comes out and says, oh, that's just molten aluminum. No way. This is not molten aluminum. They said, oh, well, it's molten aluminum mixed with organic materials like the carpets and stuff like that. Well, Stephen Jones tried an experiment trying to mix all kinds of uh, combustible materials with aluminum, and guess what? The other stuff floats on top. The aluminum won't mix. And no, the aluminum looks silvery. This is not molten aluminum. This is either molten steel or molten iron and the reason I can say that is that one of the sources of iron, not steel, is, the, is what they used as one of their incendiaries, which is thermite. And I'll get to more about thermite in a little bit, but there is a source of actual iron that this could be, all right? But here it is, pouring right out of the South Tower a minute or so before it collapses. quite a substantial amount of the stuff, right? Uh, by the way, how do you melt iron or steel? You need high temperatures, right? One of the problems is if you take uh, kerosene, which is what jet fuel is, and you take office furnishings, take all the stuff you see around you here, and you set it all on fire, there is a maximum temperature that's possible with this stuff burning in open air. Hydrocarbon material burning in open air has a maximum temperature that misses the melting point of iron by over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You're 1,000 degrees short of what's needed to melt iron on the Fahrenheit scale. So uh, that's an issue. Why do you see molten metal? Initially, the official story said the fires were so hot that it melted the steel. But then people very rapidly came back and said, but it can't melt steel. 
oh no, it didn't melt steel. It just weakened the steel. Okay, so why then is there molten steel? It turns out there is molten steel, but it didn't come from the kerosene and from the office furnishings. It had to come from a different source. So yes, the fires were hot. Yes, steel was melted. But all of that points to the fact that it was not the office furnishings and the jet fuel doing the job. So we'll get back to that, OK? This is a long story, by the way. So at some point, I'll cut it short. This is the South Tower. Another thing to notice, you see all those streamers? Here, watch this. OK, you see how fast everything's falling? Why are some things shooting out ahead? You see up here, that's the, that's the front of all the material that's falling outside the building. So what's causing this? What threw this faster than freely falling material? It's being somehow shot downward hey, due to some explosion maybe. There's a bunch of these things that shoot out ahead of the falling material. There's more of them you can see. Okay. And here's the, this last one ends with that same projectile coming out. Look at that. It got flung downward. Okay. So these are some of the same, this is the same explosion where I saw pieces bursting midair. And here's one here where you see it actually throwing this stuff down. Okay. This I think we already talked about. It's the piece that uh, came through. Um. Look at all this. So you see this racing row of ejections, and you also see individual ejections lower, like down here. See that? I mean, there's a lot of visual evidence here. And then you have these lone little things down here. Uh, stuff's going on there. So you could see the top section up here at the top falling, and all this stuff is just racing down as though something were driving it. Nothing is driving it. The falling material that might act as a pile driver theoretically, it's still up there. And all this stuff's going down the sides of the building anyway. Okay, so I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna get off of building South Tower here. Oh, I wanna show this one. Here's where it shows that inward bowing, see that? You see how it came in and just snapped out? I'll play that again. Okay, here's a rational explanation for that inward bowing. The floor trusses did pull those in, but it's not because the floor trusses by their own weight sagged. It's because the core columns have already been cut the core is coming down, and these uh, trusses are still attached to the perimeter columns. And as the floor, as the core starts to fall, it's pulling the outer walls inward at the same time. And there's another piece. It's not just this one wall. It's, um, this is at the corner. You can see the, I just did a little loop there. You see it all pulling in on both sides there? And I see how sudden it is? It's like when the core starts to fall, it pulls it in and it snaps back, all right? So this is a stabilized version. This is one of those that Nate did where you can see the, you see the frame out here moving all over. Okay, I'm going to stop that. Let's go back. Building seven. How many? have, to your knowledge, how many of you know that you have seen Building 7 fall? Raise your hand. How many are not certain that you have ever seen Building 7 fall? 
It's not one of the Twin Towers. And the reason the general population hasn't seen it is they haven't put it on TV. It's, it, it was shown the first day, and then for years it was not shown on TV. You have to go search this stuff out on the internet to even see this event. So let's do this first montage. Here. So the first penthouse falls. For how many of you was that the first time you'd ever seen that? A couple of you at least, over here too. Okay, does that look like a demolition? It looks exactly like a demolition, okay? It fell, and this is what I measured, that it fell at absolute free fall. It literally let go and was in free fall for the first two and a half seconds. Okay, let's continue here. This is... Recognize that voice? Dan Rather? It's an amazing, incredible picture work. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much of television before. But a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by low placed landmines to knock it down. That's Dan Rather on the day of 9 11 giving his first impression. Well, that looks like a demolition. Well, anybody else looking at it will say, that's a demolition. Here it is again. By the way, oh, another power source? Oh, oh <laughs> my little power switch wasn't turned on, so. Okay, I'm gonna come back here. All right, watch this up close picture here. Okay, notice how there's a bunch of windows blown off on the left side of the building there, all right? And that's what happened when the west penthouse, no, the east penthouse fell in a little bit early, and underneath that east penthouse, there's a bunch of windows that got blown out. Notice how there are not windows blown out anywhere else, really. And it starts happening after it actually starts to fall, okay? But notice up in here, you can actually see some flashes that occur. You see some flashes up there? I mean, just watching the building fall is just amazing. Okay. Now, here's my contribution to this conversation here. Here's Tracker. Okay. Um, this is the Dan Rather perspective here. And this uh, little thing right here is uh, calibration. I was, I was able to, uh, when NIST came out with their Building 7 report, it was separate from the Twin Towers report they did. And uh, they gave information in the report on the height of two points vertically that they used to time the fall. I thought, wow, that's just exactly what I needed. So I figured out where the floor was that they're talking about and then the roof line, okay? The top of the parapet, they called it. And by knowing the actual real world distance between those points, you can calibrate from counting pixels to counting meters or feet, whatever you want, all right? And so that's what, where you can get a good measurement out of this. And so watch. Now over here, notice that there's a long linear section of this graph. This is velocity versus time. If I put y position versus time, it looks like that parabolic trajectory thing again, right? But if I look at the velocity, downward velocity is a function of time and go to Analyze. If I take this section here, look at that, 9.73. That's almost as good as when I measured the soccer ball, wasn't it? This is within 1% of the acceleration of gravity. 
And depending on exactly which pixels you, which of these data points you choose, uh, here's actually 10, all right? A little under, a little over, uh, but to, with, to within the accuracy of those measurements, we're right sitting on the acceleration of gravity. So the thing that's cool about this is you don't need equations. You can just say, if it's falling at free fall, there is zero resistance. The North Tower analysis, it was two-thirds of free fall. There's some resistance. And I was able to argue that it was not enough resistance to uh, keep it from coming down. But in terms of uh, the Building 7 here, it's coming at absolute free fall. Now, NIST, in their report that was their final report, subject to public comment, they released it in August of 2008, right at the end of the Bush administration, just before the elections. Their final report came out in November, just after the elections. So they were basically, they were dragging their heels on this Building 7 report to the very end of the Bush administration, and then wham, they put it out during the lame duck period, after the election, before Obama took office, all right? So, in uh, 2008, in August of 2008, they were claiming that Building 7 came down 40% slower than freefall. And you're looking at it. Is that 40% off from freefall? No, it's within 1% of freefall, and depending on which data points you pick, it's a little bit over, a little bit under. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, amazing. And so I jumped into the act. At, I mean, that was for, this was what really, this is the reason I'm known in the truth movement, is because I didn't let that get by. I don't think I have it here, but. Uh, Where did it go? Oh, this one. Okay. Here's a little video. So I put this out late in 2008. In August 2008, after a seven year delay, NIST, the government agency charged with investigating the World Trade Center collapses, released the draft of their final report on the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 for public comment. In that report, they claimed that the time for the building to fall, the first 18 stories, that's the part of the collapse visible on many videos, was 40% longer than it would have taken had it been in free fall. I responded with a video posted on YouTube called WTC7 in free fall, in which I showed that for approximately two and a half seconds, Building 7 fell at a rate indistinguishable from free fall. Furthermore, in that video, I showed that this methodology was not a valid way to analyze the true motion of the building. This measurement was not just wrong, it was fraudulent. Then on August 26th, NIST staged a technical briefing in which engineers and others with technical credentials could pose questions. I'm a high school physics teacher, so I figured I would be excluded However, I went ahead and registered, citing my membership in the American Association of Physics Teachers as my professional affiliation. By the way, I am not speaking for AAPT. That was just my passport into the briefing. To my surprise, my credentials were accepted, and I was able to pose a question. Here's a little of how it went. Our next question comes from David Chandler of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, any number of competent measurements using a variety of methods indicate the northwest corner of WTC7 fell with an acceleration within a few percent of the acceleration of gravity. Yet your report contradicts this claiming 40% slower than free fall based on a single data point. Uh, how can such a publicly visible, easily measurable quantity be set aside? Can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> Uh, any number of measurements using a variety of methods indicate the northwest corner of 
WTC7 fell with an acceleration within a few percent of the acceleration of gravity. Yet, the report contradicts this, claiming 40% slower than the pre-fall based on a single data point. Well, um, the, first of all, um, gravity is the loading function that applies to the structure, uh, uh, applies, to, applies to everybody, every, all bodies on, uh, on, uh, on, on this particular, uh, on this planet, not just uh, um, in, in ground zero. Whoa, I used a response to like that on a physics exam when a student hasn't even bothered to open the book. But this is Ms. speaking, so let's continue. Uh, the, uh, the analysis showed there's a difference in time between a free fall time. A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. Uh, and if you look at the analysis of the video, it shows that the time it takes for the 17, uh, for the, uh, the, the roof line of the video to, do, to collapse down the 17 floors that you can actually see in the video, below which you can't see anything in the video, is about uh, 3.9 seconds. Uh, what the analysis shows, and uh, the structural analysis shows, the collapse analysis shows, it, that same time that it took for the structural model to come down from the roof line all the way for those 17 floors to disappear is uh, 5.4 seconds. It's uh, about 1.5 uh, uh, seconds or roughly 40% more time for that free fall to happen. And that is not at all unusual because there, there was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. And you had, you had, you had a sequence of structural failures that had to take place and where everything was not instantaneous. Buried in all that verbiage, what Dr. Sundar is saying is free fall for the 18 stories under consideration would have taken 3.9 seconds. However, their computer model simulated collapse required 5.4 seconds. The slower collapse time was to be expected since there was structure supporting the building as it fell, slowing the fall. But there was a progression of failures that had to take place and that these were not instantaneous. All of this makes sense as long as you don't look at the evidence. The evidence shows that free fall actually occurred, but since their computer modeling could not come up with a scenario that would allow for free fall, they had to declare free fall out of bounds and try to cover up the evidence. The problem is, unlike the columns and girders buried deep inside the building, the motion of the building is right out in plain view. Since their model predicted 5.4 seconds for the 18-story collapse, they dutifully conjured up a 5.4 second measurement to match. They had to stretch themselves to do it, but they did it. They found the disappearance time, then they went out of their way to pick an artificially early start time, exactly 5.4 seconds earlier. This they compared with freefall time. This next question comes from Dr. Stephen Jones. This discusses the fall time for WTC7 on page 40 of the summary report, where uh, it stated, assuming that the descent speed was approximately constant. However, observations uh, by others of the descent speed show that the building is accelerating uh, rather than uh, being at constant speed. Uh, so the question is, why didn't this assume that the descent speed was approximately constant? Stephen Jones was calling attention to the obviously erroneous claim on page 40 of the draft report that stated that the building ascended at constant speed. I'm sure constant speed was a simple misstatement. The correct response should have been, whoops, we'll fix that. But no, here's how they handled that question. Force of gravity obviously is, uh, uh, the acceleration of gravity is uh, what's uh, at the driving force and uh, uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that uh, uh, time was uh, established from the uh, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame um, uh, search of the, of the uh, Time, so that was down to one thirtieth of a second, um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared, and we found that uh, 
for that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds. I didn't hear a whoop in there, did you? This is John Gross, one of the lead engineers for the NIST report on the collapse of the Twin Towers. He has a PhD in structural engineering from Cornell University. He taught engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He has a long resume on top of that. Don't you think he probably knows the difference between speed and acceleration? Don't you think he could explain it with perfect clarity if he wasn't so preoccupied trying to cover his tracks? Don't you find it interesting that the 5.4 seconds he measured for the collapse time just happens to exactly match the theoretical prediction of their model? That kind of precision is incredibly rare when modeling real-world events. Incredible is the right word. It's not incredible. This measurement has all the characteristics of what we call dry labbing, manipulating the data to fit a predetermined outcome. It's an ethics violation in science on a par with plagiarism. Any engineers engaging in this kind of sleight of hand should lose their licenses. The larger implication, of course, is dry labbing in this kind of investigation would constitute a criminal cover-up. After another round of quibbling, someone had to step in and bail out poor John. Can you clarify that? I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and correct in the final version of the report. Okay. That was August. This is November. The final version of the NIST WTC7 report just came out, and guess what? We have a revised analysis of the building collapse rate. Constant speed is out. Constant acceleration is out. Instead, we have three phases of collapse, with a whopping 2.25 seconds of absolute freefall. The irrelevant 5.4 seconds is still defended in the wording, but it plays no apparent role other than CYA for John Gross and Associates. So free fall is hereby official dogma. How are they going to handle all the ramifications of that inconvenient fact? Read on. It says, the three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST NC Star 1-9. That's it. Free fall went from an impossibility that required backflips and logic to obfuscate a simple fact to be measured, then declared consistent with their fire-induced collapse hypothesis. Apparently, they have now decided that free fall is okay as long as it is seen as a part of a longer stretch of time that covers the required 5.4 seconds. In other words, they dropped the bullying tactic of blowing smoke to obscure the facts and adopted an alternate bullying tactic, cover it with a lie and walk away. However, NIST cannot walk away from Freefall. Now that NIST has certified freefall as fact, take a look at the implications. <clears throat> so there's part two and part three that I'm not going to do, but uh, they're on the internet. Um, look at what they timed here. Here is NIST's timing, 5.4 seconds, all okay? right? Go. Each, each revolution of the circle up there is one second. That's 5.4 seconds. Now, here it is, backward in slow motion. And what you need to do is figure out when an honest person would have stopped, was started the stopwatch to measure the fall of the building. That's when they started their clock. Okay? Uh, why? Well, they needed it to not be free fall because they didn't want to say it was coming in free fall because that would have implied demolition because you can't get free fall through its own structure. Buildings have a lot of resistance. You can't get free fall through an existing structure without eliminating the structure. And the falling chunk of stuff can't be what's de demolishing what's under it because it's in free fall. An object in free fall can do no work. All of the energy it has by being up high 
is being converted into energy of motion. It's being converted, what do we say, from potential energy to kinetic energy. And if it's in free fall, 100% of the energy is being converted into kinetic energy, leaving no extra energy for any other purpose. So breaking things, throwing things around, crushing stuff can't be going on while this thing is actually in free fall. So it's a proof, again, that it had to have been blown out by something else that cleared the way for this thing to fall. Yeah? It's been a long time since I've seen these videos, and I'm struck by how different the demolition of uh, Building 7 is from the demolition of the Twin Towers. Yes. Building seven. Okay, you're seeing the top half or third of the building. It's a tall building, and you're seeing over the roof lines of the intervening building. So you're only seeing the very top section. It's 47 stories. And they were only, they were seeing it, remember that view that showed it up, looking up at it? That was the video they were using to do their measurements. And you're only seeing the top 18 floors out of 47 floors. So all those demolitions have happening? Lower on. It, they needed to, in order to get the amount of free fall that occurred, they needed to blow out eight floors, low in the building. And so it was down below your line of sight. So down here, and it's probably, you know, in the very lower floors, they're blowing out eight floors worth, which gives enough speed to this falling mass that this falling mass then, once it does engage, is able to then crush the rest of itself down to nothing. That's one of the rationales when you do controlled demolition I want to tell you a little story here, is that like architects and engineers keep comparing these things to controlled demolitions. And you're familiar with controlled demolitions from what you're saying, trying to bring a building down in an urban area without and minimize damage. I had a, um, I was teaching for a number of years at a charter school, we worked with homeschool families, and one of the, a lot of the parents are on the campus quite a bit. And one of the dads uh, of one of these families uh, was actually in the military as a demolitions guy. And he was in the reserves and expecting to be called back up and sent over to Iraq. But I was talking to him, and he wouldn't have any of this. He thought, no, baloney. You know, this isn't, you know, it's conspiracy theories and stuff. And I said, have you actually watched Building 7? No, it wasn't even Building 7. I even showed him the North Tower, the first one, okay? Remember that corner view with all that stuff coming out? Okay. I have a, a video, this little loop, where I go through and comment on this as it comes down repeatedly. I showed him, I took him in my office and closed the door, and I showed him that video. And by the time we had seen it go through the loop about two or three times, he said, that's a demolition. And he went 180 degrees from absolutely, I was a nutcase, to absolute certainty that that was a demolition. And what he was seeing, I said, what is it that convinced you? And what he's seeing in the North Tower as it's coming down, let me see if I can just pull that back up real quick. Um, okay. This section right here, Okay, you see this right here? That beam up near the top, can you see where the arrow is? This is what he was looking at. Notice how that there is smoke coming off of that beam over the entire length of the beam. And just watch it. It's just bubbling off of there the entire time. You see that? And he picked up on that and said that's a demolition. That this is characteristic of when they blow up stuff 
He says the Corps of Engineers, they put stuff up, and our demolition skies, we tear it down. And he'd done hundreds of demolitions. Now the difference between military demolitions and controlled demolition is the military doesn't care what else they splatter around. So they do stuff like this. This is more like a military demolition. You're just blowing up a building rather than concern about, you know, keeping from breaking windows in the neighboring buildings and all that. And so I don't even use the term control demolition anymore. I just say demolition. Because there's another whole, you know, it's not just a few guys out there in these specialized companies that know about demolition. We have a whole military that are probably the best demolition experts in the world. And this very clearly has fingerprints of that kind of involvement. So, anyway, uh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's that as well. Also, one of the other the questions I wanted to ask about the seven was so it sounds like what they're, what NIST was, was, um, was calculating off of was coordinate points between, between basically one frame, between three frames of the public. They were like taking a measurement with a stopwatch where you have a starting time and an ending time. Because, because the time code would be different depending on what device you play it back and how many times it's been processed, whether it's been, if it's been uh, put on, on the internet, then, 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 you know, it's basically like what happens when you see somebody, when you put somebody's uh, voice over to a, to a picture and all of a sudden their, their voice. So you're saying the, the videos could be corrupted? Well, this, all right. We have a, a Freedom of Information Act release. We have like, I have a couple of hard drives at home full of three terabytes of NIST videos. Okay. And you can do this with NIST videos, but there's actually better quality videos. Uh, uh, Nate who I mentioned earlier is this video archivist guy. He, just, I've, I just found out recently he is the one who discovered it, but they, they discovered a repository on the internet where all of the major uh, networks posted. He has complete first day coverage from the networks in the original format, all right? I'm, I'm using something that was derived from that, but I mean, uh, Nate basically found this site and they started, a bunch of the guys started downloading all of this stuff. We have the entire site downloaded, okay? And so we have better quality videos than what NIST released on the Freedom of Information Act and there's one guy who's trying to pursue NIST over how come we didn't get the high quality versions when we're supposed to you know, they should have released the high-quality versions when we demanded it on a FOIA, but they didn't. And we have better quality versions than NIST had, or at least what NIST released. So that, I think, is not a substantial problem. Uh, these measurements can be duplicated in a lot of different videos. You're not going to mess with the frame rate. It's going to be 30th of a second frame rate, it's a tw uh, 29.97 frames per second, whatever. All right, so it's, it's a standard frame rate. Yeah, well, in fact, it encodes the frame rate right in the video. When you put it in, it'll actually read what the frame rate was. Okay, so yes, we have, I'm, I'm sure, I am confident we have reliable data we're basing our measurements on and other guys in AE911 Truth that have more expertise than I do on the video side of things are, I'm working hand in glove with them on this. So I'm not concerned about this being corrupted in that sense. Now there's a certain, you know, if you just say you download it off the internet, that sounds crude, 
but we're getting the stuff that's, that's, that hasn't been posted. I mean, it, it, there's copies of it on the internet, but we're actually getting uh, the more pristine copies to work with. Okay. Well, I'm sort of doing that on an ongoing basis, but. How do you have people jumping out windows without uh, equalizing the air pressure? I'm saying, once you blow out windows or open windows or whatever they did, they had lots of open windows because a lot of people came tumbling out. And once it started coming down the sides, you saw all of this stuff blowing out the sides. So windows and a lot more were being blown out. So I think the difference in pressure that you're talking about isn't relevant to what's happening during the collapse of the building. The HVAC system to a tall building like that, the pressurization would be nothing like an airline at 30,000 feet. It would be very minor compared to that. So the, the pressurized aspect would be very minor. Right. And they talk about if you basically have the building coming down like a piston, and some of these people are saying, well, how did it get to these focused little spots, you know, 30 or 50 feet, 30 or 50 floors lower? Oh, well, maybe through the air ducts. Well, uh, what kind of pressure does it take to blow out an air duct compared to what it takes to blow out one of those windows? You know, if you're going to have enough focused air pressure to blow out a window, it seems like that aluminum sheet metal stuff is going to be in splinters long before the window would reach breakable. Well, I do know. That's a ridiculous idea. That's my point, is that... Okay. I'm saying people are proposing these as serious proposals. They are ridiculous ideas. They throw them out there, but they don't work. They're, they are not true, and you can show that they can't be true. So by the time you have blown out all of these windows down the side of the building, you have nothing to hold excess air pressure in place. So I don't think any argument based on air pressure in the buildings, whether it's from a piston effect or from this air conditioning effect or anything you describe, I don't think any of that can have anything really to do with what's going on. I think you can't avoid the fact we are seeing explosions. And I think that's concludable from what we're seeing here. So I'm not willing to just, oh, wave my hands. I think you have to distinguish between silly ideas and ideas that you can support. And I mean, I can, I'm not trying to say you're silly. I'm trying to say the people who are making these arguments and trying to make them stick. NIST made these arguments. You're quoting NIST. You're, maybe you're not quoting NIST, but NIST has done the same thing. And they certainly have the expertise to know that what they're saying doesn't make sense. I'm sorry I get a little bit worked up. So anyway, do you see what I'm saying, though? It might have been pressurized.
I just want to say, by the way, just to insert into this, I mean, I'm responding, I guess, to, there's a whole, there's a whole culture of denial of the stuff that we're talking about. Pseudo skeptics. And the skeptic society is part of that. There's the JREF forum on the internet, which is part of that whole thing. There's that whole popular mechanics, did a big major expose. There's National Geographic, who has, has done a couple of terrible exposes on television over L, uh, various aspects of this. There's this whole effort to paint the 9-11 truth movement as a marginalized, non-credible um, response to 9-11. Sounds like Mike Sherman. He's involved. He's one of them, yes. There's a whole, there's a whole culture of people out there. Excuse me, I'm not hearing you. What? Okay, that's fine. I'm not trying to attack you. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, part of the emotion that came back out, I think, in my thing is, I've been attacked a lot, and I basically, hey, I have, somebody called a, my attention just yesterday. There's this guy named Alien Entity on the internet. Go look him up. He, I'm his pet project. He's out there to debunk everything I've ever done. He's been at it for several years, so he won't acknowledge who he is. But I mean, there's people out there who, uh, for whom uh, debunking this and making it seem crazy is their way of helping this not gain traction. I don't doubt that. It's, it's, the, it's the scientific part of the, uh, uh, well, let's try, and, let's try and disprove something or, or answer, see if this, this has any weight. How can it not, how can it not hold up? Okay. And if it holds up after all of that, then it's a solid theory. If not, then it's not. So okay. That's, that's all the only way I'm looking at it. I don't have any problem with that, and thank you, and I'm sorry. All right. I'm just trying to explain that I, I feel like I sort of came on a little strong there, okay? But what I'm responding to in the process of responding to your questions is where I've heard those exact arguments made was this whole realm of debunking, all right? And so that was what I really wanted to let you know is the, the debunking websites, uh, the JREF Forum, the, the Skeptic Society, Popular Mechanics, all of those are, they have a major lack of credibility if you actually start looking at them critically. And so, yes, it's an interesting question, but then I think it has a straightforward answer, is that no pressurization can't account for what we're seeing. That's my answer to it, anyway. And you can ponder that more if you like on your own. Is that okay for right now? I guess so, at least that's the thing I would ask why. Why what? Why, I mean, why pressurization can't account for this lack of reality? Because once you have, once you have several waves of demolitions, did you see the one where I was talking about the lower wave had already come swept through all of this? and you still have all of these pinpoint ejections coming up above there, this lower wave had already come by there. It had opened up all of these floors. There's no closed compartments to pressurize. Once you open the windows, you have atmospheric pressure inside and out. Now there's gonna be, as the floors come together, there's gonna be an increase in pressure like that, and so that's why you get a puff of stuff and all that, but we're talking about focused ejections through floors that haven't collapsed yet. This floor is here, this floor is here, they stay there, and there's a thing that comes out in between. What's gonna cause that? It's not gonna be pressure in the air conditioning system, and it's not gonna be generalized air pressure on that floor, which has already been opened up. It doesn't work as far as I can see. Okay.
I, I guess that's as far as I need to go on that one right now. Any other questions while we're taking questions? I'll try not to jump down your throat. <laughs> Sorry about that. But you're passionate about it. Oh, yeah. Sure. No, I've been at this for a few years, and you have to sort of back up every once in a while. And every, you know, I get into seeing these buildings come down, and I'm looking at jets, and I'm looking at stuff being flung around. The other thing is, that building had a couple thousand people in it. It was coming down with people inside. So we're talking about something with um, visceral information here. I have a, here, just a second. I have to find it. <laughs> um, Okay, that's the distribution of human remains. It's all over the map. If you had people crushed between floors of a falling building, you would have the human remains in the footprints of the building. But the human remains that were found on 9-11 are in the entire uh, field of where all of this, these clouds of debris were. They were blown out with everything else. Including, they have... Including a human thumb found about a few years ago, two blocks, three blocks away on top of a building. They okay. found that place. Well, uh, on, at the... I, you need to fill me in on the details of that one. I've seen a human thumb, and I didn't get that context, but I'm not sure. Okay. I do know that the uh, Deutsche Bank building, which was across the street, uh, had human remains on the roof in terms of like uh, millimeter size bone fragments. Now, how do you get the bone fragments from the rubble pile to the top of the building? You don't. It has to have come from high in the building. How do you get the, a person reduced to millimeter scale bone fragments in the process of also launching these fragments horizontally to where they can land on the top of adjacent buildings. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you're looking practically, this is a picture of uh, an explosive event which, and in this particular case, the distribution of bone fragments and things like that is part of the evidence of what we're looking at. This is an explosive event, not a building collapse. Yeah, question? So with stuff emitted, we know thermite is a molecule because it has more traditional construction. It's not designed to sort of sway in the wind. So the way that it transfers heat from the structure. Okay, I haven't really talked about nanothermite yet. But uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think, I don't know. Uh, there was probably a mixture of techniques used in all the buildings. Uh, what she's talking about as far as nanothermite, thermite is, I'll, I'll just diverge over to thermite for a minute. Thermite is a material that's made of powdered iron oxide and raw aluminum, I mean elemental aluminum. And the iron and the aluminum, and then there's the oxygen attached to the iron, okay? Iron holds on to that oxygen, sort of. Aluminum has a much stronger attraction for the oxygen than the iron does. So if you heat up this mixture until the oxygen can get free from the iron, it just gloms on to the aluminum in a very intense reaction that liberates lots of energy in the form of high temperature. And they can use this, it's not normally thought of as an explosive, it's something that they used to use for welding railroad tracks, uh, the bombs they dropped on Dresden, all that, the fire bombing that they used in World War II, this thermite, 
They use it to demolish tanks. I mean, there's all kinds of uses of thernite. But it's basically a very high temperature incendiary. Now, if you're going to use thermite in part of this demolition, what it would be doing would probably be some of the pre-weakening. It's a slower process than an explosion. It's not a high explosive, okay? But uh, they can use it for the pre-weakening, and then they probably had some kind of more conventional charges to, uh, you know, as far as time charges, to bring it all down at the final step. However, the thermite that they have discovered at, in the dust of the World Trade Center consists of thermite made of nanoparticles. So the, what a nanoparticle is, is a particle that's smaller than a micron. Okay, so uh, you know, a thousand times smaller than a, a micron is like, all right, like a red blood cell is like seven microns, I believe it is, all right, across. So we're talking about, huh? Okay, so you go smaller than that. The particles that make up this nanothermite are a very uniform uh, consistency. The iron oxide that's in there is about, uh, I believe it's 100, 100 nanometers across, a tenth of a micron, and the flakes of aluminum that are in there are about, I think they said it was like 50 nanometers thick, little tiny flakes, and this is all embedded in a polymer that holds it all together. So it's very uniform mixture that's bonded together, it's a manufactured material it's stuff that's manufactured in the military labs. It's not available like at Lawrence Livermore and Sandia and places like this. It's not available on the open market. Okay? They found flakes, they, we, uh, Stephen Jones, who was quoted on that video you saw earlier. Stephen Jones and a number of others that are, uh, he's a physicist, and then Niels Herritz, a chemist from Denmark, and. There's a bunch of these guys who collaborated. They studied this stuff for 18 months. They used electron microscopes. They used uh, all sorts of different ways of analyzing this. And it basically points to the fact that uh, they have flakes of unexploded nanothermite in the dust. When you take one of these flakes and you put it in a digital calorimeter and you raise the temperature, there comes a point where it triggers. And when it triggers, it goes off, it releases lots of energy very quickly. What you have in the ashes after you're done are microspheres of iron. Because the iron from the iron oxide is now turned into just plain iron. The oxygen is forming with aluminum to form aluminum oxide, which is like a white powder. And so you have these hot iron little microspheres that result, which means that when that little flake reacted, it produced temperatures hot enough to melt iron. So in other words, it's behaving like thermite. So these little tiny red chips, they show that, yes, it appears to have the consistency, has the composition of thermite, and it also behaves like thermite. And it's thermite made with nanoparticles. The reason they make it with tiny particles is it gives you a more reactive surface. So you can trigger it with a lower temperature and you get a very quick reaction. You can actually tailor it to act like an explosive. Okay, so it's not a high explosive like RDX or something, but it's, it can actually be used as an explosive. It can be used as rocket fuel. It can be used as an incendiary. Very, okay. so, this stuff was found in large quantities in the dust. And the byproducts, which are these iron spheres, they had billions of these iron spheres in the dust. And so these are signs that this was present. Now, does that mean that was the thing they used to, to blow it up? It doesn't mean that. It means it was used. They also could have used more conventional explosives along with it. There was a question at the back, though. So, David, what's your estimation of how many thermites you needed to recreate this model in the Earth's atmosphere? Well, that's a good question. Uh, 
Um, no, hundreds of tons. Hundreds of tons. They, the estimates that I have seen on how much of the nanothermite was involved based on, you take the iron spheres and the dust and you can compute how much material produced all of those iron spheres. These iron spheres are not molten steel. These are not from the structural steel. This is the iron that originated as part of the thermite itself, okay? But from the chemical analysis of the spheres, it's pure iron, not steel, okay? And so from the estimate of how much of that there was, the estimates that I have heard Niels Herrett and others uh, make about this was that it's probably on the order of, I mean, there, it's a guesstimate, but on the order of 100 tons rather than, say, a ton or something like that. Now, there's a famous, for me it's famous, there's a quote when he was being interviewed by, a, uh, by the press, and they said, how do they sneak that in there, you know? Well, it's not under somebody's turban. You know, how do you get all that stuff into the Trade Center to uh, take it down? And his answer, very good answer I thought, is on pallets, okay? So you basically imagine this. You get a guy with a workman's shirt on, a label on the back, says Ace Elevator. They set out their cones and they've shut down, you know, one elevator shaft at a time and they're doing elevator repairs. Guess what? They were doing elevator repairs for nine months leading up to 9-11. All right? So these elevator repairmen would have access to all the core columns from the elevator shafts. And they could just wheel anything you want in there. They get passed through security. So if security was told to let these guys in, they can get in. You don't have to sneak it in you just have to have somebody authorized to let you through. How about the perimeter columns? There were some of the perimeter columns where there's evidence of monkeying with them too. Uh, there's, lots, there's a lot of the floors that were not fully occupied. So there would be a lot of unoccupied territory they would have access to. And even if, you know, there's all kinds of rationales. Workmen are, are around these buildings all the time. But the, the major thing they had to do is take out the core. And the core they had access to through the elevators. Yeah? Do you think this could be explosive just because the, uh, they didn't have access to the perimeter columns? They had to use extra space. Um, well, Tony Zambodi is an engineer back in New Jersey. And he and I have had a lot of dialogue on this topic. Uh, uh, he's one of the guys on Architects and Engineers uh, board right now, actually. But um, his idea is basically, you know, if you're, gonna t if you're gonna make sure that this building comes down, you wanna take out, you know, where the walls come together, you know, you gotta strip those joints apart to have the walls so they're gonna guarantee they're gonna come down. And so part of structurally disassembling the building is you wanna make sure that you cut the corner columns. And so I'm sure there were frequent charges put on the corner columns. Justin Keogh, who I mentioned, uh, has proposed another mechanism for uh, attacking the perimeter columns. Is these, uh, you know, these columns were offset, you know, three floors at a time. You saw the picture early on. And they're bolted together with these big old hefty bolts. And there's this little, uh, if you basically have access to that perimeter column, you could reach in there and remove the bolts on a lot of these. You know, the building will still stand up. It's designed to withstand hurricane winds and all kinds of things. But I'm sure that there are a lot of places, I mean, his, his hypothesis is one of the ways of demolishing the perimeter was to remove belt these, a lot of these bolts. If you look in the scrap piles, uh, there's a lot of these, um, uh, perimeter wall units, and you look where the little panel is where the bolt holes are, and they're undamaged. 
How do those get ripped apart and stay undamaged? And one of the ways is by just going there and take some bolts out. Uh, that's nice and, you know, a few workmen tinkering with things, nobody knows what they're doing and so much, yeah. I have a question about the molten steel. Am I getting into your presentation? Hmm? Uh, yeah, there is, of course, in your course about not just the course, but the visual evidence of liquid steel at the bottom of these three buildings. Mm -hmm. It couldn't. I, how, do you, how do you explain that? I have lots of people I deal with that give me that question. I can't explain I'm not a tech guy. So. It couldn't. If you melt steel, it's going to re-solidify within a few minutes, isn't it? You'd expect it to. You would expect it to, and it probably is. And so if you find molten steel weeks after the event, it means there have to be ongoing reactions continually melting more steel. Hmm. It's mind boggling. It's, huh? It's mind boggling to understand how much that material is there to continue that process. Do you think that the nanothermite would be somehow, would just consume itself in a short time and be done? Well, apparently there was an excess amount yeah. because there were reactions going on. They literally uh, were pouring water on ground zero till, I mean, for months. This was September. The last fires were not out until after the first of the year. Now, how do you keep a fire? I've been around a house that burned down, and, you know, there'll be smoldering a little bit late in the day and maybe the next day, and then it's cool, right? So how do you have a building where these fires, weeks after the event, they're out there and their boots are still melting and all of this, and they describe it as like, like, here, I'm gonna, um, I'm not sure if this is the one. Okay, here's the classic video on that issue. You recognize John Gross? Into flames. 
which was uh, pretty spooky to see. Which is the point where um, we were creating that pocket by moving the steel, purely falling from the ground, it would not cause the ground to blow up. Uh, but you know, these underground fires were just uh, fires of hell. Six weeks. Now to follow up, okay, this is in the FEMA report, which was the first scientific investigation uh, fairly early on after the uh, disaster. And this is a piece of steel from Building 7, and you can see how it's like thinned down to be razor sharp, and there's definite sh signs of melting. There's even some discussion of vaporization. I mean, it's very, very anomalous to have something like that result in a building fire. And this was discussed in the FEMA report in Appendix C. However, the NIST report did not deal with that. Guess who this is? <laughs> and guess what this is? This is that, you can identify it from the little flex and everything involved. This is the same piece of steel that the FEMA investigation looked at and said had all of the signs of melting. And here he is, looks like he's just shot a, a buck, you know. Uh, anyway. Huh? Yeah, he's grandstanding. And it's, you know, this is back before the NIST investigation began. 
So he was part of that FEMA investigation too. He was the one that helped select some of the what's going to be kept and what's going to be trashed. Most of the steel from Ground Zero got cut up, sent off to China, and melted down. There's only a few hundred pieces that have been cataloged and kept by NIST. Okay? And he was involved in that process and I guess, you know, minimized incriminating evidence, I guess, but there he is. At that stage, he was thinking, oh, this is quite a good find. Uh, sort of comes back to haunt him. Anyway, uh, I, have, I have another few hours worth of material if you want to keep going. Yeah? Well, yeah. Hey, it's only five o'clock. We have four hours here, don't we? Okay, there are a number of initiatives trying to do this. You have to realize, uh, think about it. Look, all right, the obvious implication, all right, it's obvious to me, maybe I'll make that more obvious. The implications of this being a demolition is that it was prepared. It took months of work to set it up for a demolition. The implication is the airplane collisions were part of the cover story. That's actually part of the cover-up of what was really going on. So I'm not one who will say, no, those airplanes weren't really there, they were just holograms. You have all kinds of wild-eyed theories out there that I believe are planted in the media specifically to try to discredit this kind of inquiry. No, so yes, there were planes. Uh, whether there were hijackers on board has been questioned. Whether they were controlled by people or controlled like drones. I mean, you can actually fly a plane from outside the plane. And so uh, there is some evidence that they were, uh, they were brought in and they were targeted. It turns out that hitting those twin towers with these planes was a very difficult option. Um, you'd think that they're just sitting out there, but the planes weren't st sitting out there aiming at the building. If here's the South Tower, the plane that came at it was coming in this direction. It made two, only two maneuvers. It tilted its wings and made one direction change, and then in the last seconds, it made a slight correction and it went straight into the building. And there was crosswinds. And so it's not line of sight. So it seems very likely to me and to a lot of other people that these were being uh, computer guided. And it seems, in fact, that they were uh, predestined to hit known targets in the building, like the specific floors where I mean, Kevin Ryan has done an analysis of who occupied which floors in the towers. And the companies that were occupying the floors that actually got hit by the planes are actually companies that should be on the suspects list as being involved in this. And it seems that this whole thing has a lot to do with the military-industrial complex, uh, security agencies, various you know, who's who and who's NSA, who's CIA, who's the FBI, whatever. But I mean, and the military. Shadow the shadow government would be a, a sort of a name to put over it. That there is definitely, wh whoever it was who took the towers down had to have access to nanothermite, which was a military material. They had to have access to the buildings 
So they had to have high level clearance to, to have to come in and out at will. Uh, they had to have been able to coordinate with uh, the hijackers and the whole backstories. Uh, you know, these guys were being tracked around in Florida and California and everywhere else. And so coordinating that whole scenario, and they had to coordinate with the military to not shoot down the planes. It had to coordinate with the civilian air controllers to put them off base. They had uh, war games going on that drew a lot of the, supposedly they drew a lot of the fighter planes out of the eastern seaboard. They were off in Canada and uh, Alaska and all these areas over there doing war games and leaving the eastern seaboard vulnerable. So all of these things at very high levels had to have been coordinated. So it does not look like a few guys in a cave are pulling this off. It looks like it was, you know, when they say inside job, it has become a trite phrase. But I, you know, phrase it however you like. It had to have been somebody with high level insider connections to, to make this thing work. Well, I'm just saying, I know. Okay, all right. I just wanted to establish that, that it appears that this kind of evidence that I'm just sort of picking around, you know, I'm like, I'm dealing with physical evidence, which then feeds into the bigger picture of what's the whole uh, picture look like. Okay. There are a lot of people with a lot to lose if this ever goes down. If this ever gains traction, it's like we're up against people that have real power. And so it's, right now, it doesn't seem like we're making a lot of headway. There are some initiatives. NIST is being taken to court over fraud. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to see how judges are going to, you know, write it off. I mean, there have been a number of court uh, approaches to this. I don't know. My approach is keep doing what I'm doing and raise public consciousness. There's a certain critical mass there that's probably necessary. Uh, I don't know. So I'm, I mean, I don't have my fingertips on that level of, you know, this is a movement and each person in the movement does what they can do. Oh, no. The best way they've responded is just ignore it. That's fine. Oh, by the way, before everybody leaves, 911speakout.org is my website. We have cards here if you want to take one with you. But, okay. There's a lot more stuff there. Anyway, uh, yes, there are some initiatives. One of the guys uh, who has a family member who was killed in England, he's trying various lawsuits from England. Uh, there's a, there are a number of them. Uh, Tony Zambodi, who I've mentioned a couple of times, an engineer that I've worked with in this, he is looking at very concrete evidence of blatant, actual, provable fraud on the basis of NIST in their analysis of Building 7. Here's what NIST says brought down Building 7. It was just fire. And here's column 79 towards the left side of the building as we were looking at it, towards the east side of the building. And there's a number of girders that support it laterally, each floor, okay? And here's a girder. And then there are beams that come under the floors that butt up against this girder. And NIST claims that the fires under the 13th floor, uh, in other words, the 12th floor fires heating up the girders overhead, cause these beams to expand and push this girder off its seat, had to break the connection and push it off its seat to where it would leave this column unsupported, and somehow that failure propagated down several floors, and if you leave a long enough stretch of a vertical column unsupported, it can then buckle. 
So they're saying that's what caused the east penthouse, the first penthouse you saw it cave in, that that's what caused that to fail. And that once you caused that to fail, it started a progression of failures that propagated across the building, and then the interior of the building sort of gutted itself out, and then all we were looking at, you see, was just this outer shell. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all, because what's going on inside clearly has some effect on what you see on the outside, okay? But in any case, that was what they're saying. Well, it turns out, number one, the seats that these girders are sitting on, this claimed they were 11 inches. And it turns out that they were calculating how much thermal expansion was needed to push this girder off the seat, and it would have had to move at least five and a half inches. Well, hey, that's right to the border of 11 inches, right? Five and a half times two is 11. Well, it turns out that the blueprints have now been released through Freedom of Information Act, and they're not 11 inches, they're 12 inches. Secondly, the thermal expansion that would cause this beam to expand would also cause that beam to sag. And so there's, by heating it, you increase its length, but you also cause it to sag. And so it turns out there's a certain maximum amount of push that's even possible before the sagging dominates over the pushing. It turns out it can't get there from here. You can't get this beam off its seat. Furthermore, the beam, and the girder rather, is an I-beam. It's a huge thing, but it's like a, it's a thing called a web. It's the central part of the I-beam, and there's these T-like things at the top and bottom, okay? But, and so they're saying if you get the web, the central thing, off the edge of the support, then that, the, this, this part here would just flex, but that's weak by comparison. So if you get it that far, it's as good as gone. What they did not point out is in the blueprints, that I-beam had stiffeners. There was actual thick plates that were welded in that would make the entire thing so it doesn't behave like an I-beam. It, it would be able to support 10 times the, the weight that the I-beam by itself could support. Those stiffeners were left out of this model. There were pins connecting the girders to the concrete. Those were left out of the model. And there were some uh, support, there were other support structures that would keep certain things from buckling. Those were left out of the model. And so there's several items that NIST had to have eliminated in order to make their mechanism work and so in order to say that they could predict how it could fail, they are clearly doing blatant actual fraud. They are, they are misrepresenting the data they had in front of them to make it look like this could have led to a failure when there's no way that uh, it could have failed on that kind of mechanism. So that could go to court. Sure. That's right. Well, that was one of the actual wording they used in the, you know, that was one of the permissible reasons for not releasing the information is if it could, if it was a, yeah. Yeah, just a second. Back here. I'm here to compromise national security, right? No, I'm here to, I'm here because I have a duty as a citizen to, you know, I'd like this country to be as great as I was taught it was when I was a kid, you know? I think the wording would jeopardize public safety. Yeah. 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 Why there was some kind of emergency building codes complication in the country to look at the buildings that can fall down from office flyers. I mean, that never happened. What is your take on that community that didn't make that happen? 
Well, I think there's a lot of people who way down deep recognize that this is a bunch of baloney and they weren't going to go complicate their own lives by adding to the codes unless they were forced to and nobody was pushing that to happen and it's just sort of one of those inconsistencies. So I think, uh, I think the, buildings, the building codes were fine but it's not consistent with their proclamation about what caused them to fail. Yeah. Are we talking Judy Wood here? Well, well, what is your view on the bathtub not, and, and also the lack of a bigger mound of rubble after these things went down? I think there is plenty of rubble to account for the, what was in the buildings. I think that's a red herring, and I don't give Judy Wood any credibility whatsoever. So that's my answer to that whole issue. So, yeah? Yeah. And they're clearly demolishing separately. Do you have any theories on why the difference in Kevin Wood and Kevin Eaves is the two types of buildings? Well, I don't, okay, I don't see that as part of my agenda to try and explain every detail of I what, I, I, I'm, I'm going to answer it a little bit. I think that part of the reason they did it differently is that the towers were so tall that, um, you know, you don't normally demolish things that are that tall because those are pretty exceptional buildings. And so they were able to take them down from the top down and make sure the whole thing demolished. They wanted to get rid of all of the, not only the buildings, but they wanted to get rid of all the evidence. They had it all fall in a small enough pile that they were able to scoop it up and melt it down and get rid of it. I think they were concerned that if you have too much of the bare bones stuff exposed to public scrutiny, it's going to show the mechanism of demolition. And the people who uh, cleaned up the site was a demolition company that uh, knew what to look for, you know. I'm sure they were out there scavenging everything that would be, uh, you know, questionable. Well, I mean, again, it's speculation, but there are, if you go and read who was in Building 7, it was a lot of security type agencies, the Secret Service, the CIA, I, I might misquote yeah, some of these. SEC, SEC. Yeah, it's everybody in imaginable. Yeah, the Enron investigation, the records from that was in there, and so forth. So there's a lot of things uh, that there was a lot of things going on at a lot of levels. And so I'm not going to say this is why it happened, but it was clearly part of their agenda. Um, anyway, I saw another hand somewhere back there. Yeah? So, how corrupt is our higher education system? What universities, public or private, are, are, are allowed to be allowed to think about all these scientific facts that you bring out? You're a retired educator. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure they're not allowed to. I think they're intimidated out of it. Uh, I think that there is, or there's a very good video that's now available called 9-11 uh, in Academia or something like that. The Academic Community. 9-11 uh, in the Academic Community. It's an excellent video, and uh, I recommend you get a hold of it and if you, yeah. you have a copy. So see him and watch it because it's the same idea, how come the media doesn't cover this? Not only is Fox News not covering this, Amy Goodman, Rachel Maddow, uh, Bill Moyer, Bill Maher, Jon Stewart, none of these people, all of them poke fun at the 9-11 truth movement as though we're a bunch of crazies. And, and I'm saying that there is very heavy pressure at a certain level 
to go along with certain basic fundamentals that this country is not as corrupt as all of this implies. Not much. Okay. I came up to, all right, I'm, I live here in Portland now, but a few years ago before I moved up here, uh, I came up to a physics teachers conference in Portland. And I did a, uh, did a talk and I had a poster, a poster session, if you've been to these academic conferences. And so I had, by how many people took my flyer, I know about 100 people came by my poster and I had conversations on an ongoing basis throughout the evening with a lot of these guys. They'd come up and they typically would smirk and they would treat it as sort of a joke and I would point out and I said, did you realize Building 7 came down at absolute free fall? And they said, no, you know, no way. I said, well, here's my data, take a look. You go over there and start reading some of this stuff and then they would leave and they'd come back with their friends. I mean, these guys, most of them had not heard of Building 7. And these are guys like, this is my peer group. So physics teachers at the high school and junior college and four-year college level, you know, the undergraduate type, that section through there makes up what's called the AAPT, American Association of Physics Teachers. And this group of people are, well, they have to be intelligent enough to understand and be able to teach physics. And they typically are fairly literate in day-to-day -day events of the world and so forth. They're intelligent people. And most of them hadn't heard of Building 7. Uh, and those who had, hadn't seen it. And they hadn't done any work on it. I mean, what I did was I actually, I put out a bit of effort to get together all the things I needed to make these measurements. And by the way, I just realized uh, here. Where did my, <laughs> okay, here we are. Here's 911speakout.org. This is my website. I just want to show you something here. Over here, see that? It says physics lab. What I just recently did was, uh, here's a picture of Building 7. I realized, this was literally very recent here. I said, in discussing my measurement of the free fall of Building 7 with one reluctant physics professor, locally here, the professor at one point protested, I'll take your word for it, but for the sake of argument, but I have no way to confirm your claims for myself. I said, it astounded me because it was such a straightforward measurement, right? But then I started realizing, I actually was relying on collaboration with a number of key people to get together the videos, the data that I needed to calibrate the measurements, and all of these things, the software to do this with. I realized there is a fair amount of work that it would take for you to go out and reproduce my results. So I put together a kit. Here's the lab instructions, like you could hand this, if you're a physics professor, you could hand this to a kid and say, here's your project. Here's the lab instructions, here's all the materials, uh, you can download it as a zip file here. And so if you're looking for a project, are you looking for a project? You're excited. <laughs> yes, you could basically go in and duplicate, you could do for yourself and make sure I didn't fudge you can go through and measure the motion of Building 7. You can use those same tools on other videos to measure other things, too. Once you get the skills, there's no stopping you, okay? You can do what I'm doing. And here's a little, I put together a little tutorial on using Tracker and all of it. So everything I use to put together these measurements, I put it together as a little lab. To, if you're interested, go for it. Do the measurements yourself, or assign it to your students. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I say one thing. Uh, 
there's another dynamic about not uh, looking at this information. Kirk Schrader is our District 5 U.S. representative. And in September, I asked him if he had seen Building 7 go down. Did you know about Building 7? Did you know there were three towers? He said, no, I didn't. I said, Kirk, would you look at a video of Building 7 coming down? He said, no, I don't have time right now. I saw him at another candidate forum two weeks later, and I said, Kirk, 30 seconds. I want you to look at Building 7 going down. He said, I'm not going to look at it. I saw him a week later at another candidate forum. I said, Kirk, would you look at Building 7's collapse? No, I won't. What the hell is going on? People are afraid to get, you're aware of what's they don't want to go down that road because they don't want to go where the evidence leads. They know where the evidence leads or have it at a subconscious level. They know where that's going and they don't want to go there because it's opening too big a can of worms. Uh, so like I was saying earlier, I, I mentioned all these, you, you know, these liberal people on the media, why won't they do it? I mean, they open all kinds of cans of worms. But they don't want to do this one because it touches too critically at the core values of who we think we are. And if, it, if you start questioning the fundamental belief system of what it is to be a virtuous American in this exceptional, you know, American exceptionalism, that we aren't like everybody else, I mean, Oh, well, I mean, yeah. The problem with this, you can see already, the problem I have in talking about all of this is it's so big. All I can do is nibble around the edges. My angle on it is I focus on the build di building dynamics because that's what I have done some work on. But then what I normally do, if you watch the videos I've done talking about this on my website, I basically have narrowed it down. There's three primary lines of evidence that all agree and converge on this. One is the building dynamics, which is pretty much all of this stuff tonight. The second one is the evidence for high temperatures. There were temperatures 1,000 degrees hotter in the World Trade Center than you could account for by the fuels that they claim dro drove this thing. And the third is the discovery of the nanothermite which puts, you know when they did the, an, when they had the anthrax scare, it was after 9-11? They originally were trying to tie that to Saddam Hussein. This came from Iraq. Well, I mean, it was a way of framing Saddam Hussein. Except the DNA from the anthrax pointed back to the source, and they said, oh, that came from military labs here in this country, and all of a sudden, you quit you know, this investigation started going nowhere, okay? So it's like that was the DNA evidence. Well, the DNA evidence for the World Trade Center is the nanothermite. It points directly at the military-industrial complex. So the U.S. military, the U.S. intelligence services, and then the corporate uh, structures like all of these companies that live off of, uh, profiteer off of war. That these are the folks that brought us 9-11. Yeah. Oh yeah, look, hey, you know the established, there was something on in a movie I saw just recently. They were, it was just sort of this litany of all of the buildup, like how much, how many billions of dollars rely on this whole concept of a war on terror. I mean, the whole infrastructure for the war on terror is billions upon billions and billions of dollars. I'm sure it's in the trillions or getting up close to that. And do you think they're gonna let go of that? I mean, and so there's a lot of people that have heavy motivation to make sure this gets nowhere. So I'm being subversive. So I'm out here trying to, uh, do what I do in spite of all that. So, there you go. 
Somebody had a f hand up, but yeah. I didn't hear what you said. Who? Uh, on March 7th. Oh, yeah? Here, right here, we're going to have a presentation on 9-11 and how it connects to geopolitics. So I thought about what uh, uh, one of the presentations this semester. Who's doing that? I'm, I'm doing that. So There's a lot of our friends in the area. Oh, OK. Are you a faculty member here? Okay. Well, it is 5:30, so. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. So, if you want to ask another question, hang around afterwards. Uh, nanothermite, all it takes to de detonate it is uh, get the temperature up to a critical temperature. So, it could be detonated. so if, you, if you raise the temperature to a certain threshold, any nanothermite that gets to that temperature would then ignite. So you're saying it could be detonated? I'm just telling you, the only way I see, so you probably have explosives of other kinds that raise the temperature and then all this other stuff could kick in. That's my so estimate. I don't know. All right. Mr. Chandler, just well, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Absolutely superb. Okay.